I'm going to invite you to take a seat, grab your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to Romans chapter 12. The book of Romans is where we've been camping out for a while. We're coming towards the end, but we're still in Romans chapter 12. And uh, if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app, uh, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Uh, that's what it's there for. Turn to page 1,127, and you will find our text for the evening. 1,127 is the page. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one of these with you. We're serious. Take one of these with you because we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. So Romans chapter 12 is our text. Let me ask you a question. How many of you like fake stuff? Not a lot of hands go up. See, I was in China recently, and they, they excel in fake stuff. It's not quite as prevalent as it's been in the past when I've been there. They're kind of cracking down-ish. But, uh, you know, you can go in and, and you can buy a coach purse for 10 bucks. You know, you can, you can get all kinds of fake stuff. If you're not careful, you'll get fake food in some restaurants. Uh, I mean... They, they do fake really well, uh, and, and so let's just ask, how many of you ladies would prefer a real coach purse over a fake one? Okay, a lot of you ladies didn't raise your hand. You don't care. Okay. Take note, men. Uh, so, see, I'm not going to ask the husbands how many of you would prefer a real one to a fake one, because I know they're like, the fake one's 10 bucks. I'm all in for fake, right? See, but if you're receiving it, you want the real thing. Uh, how many of you ladies would prefer diamonds over cubic zirconia? Zirconia or fake? Yeah, okay. It's like uh, the man again, don't ask, okay? Just pay attention. You don't want to give them the fake stuff. All right, how, how many of you, uh, how many men want the fake burger? You know, we're talking about bean or vegetable burger. <laughs> Any guys, you, you, you prefer that over meat? I didn't think so. So you want the real burger. Wait, how about this one? Would, do you want the real cheddar or, or do you want that processed imitation cheese food? Yeah, see, so you want the real cheddar, right? See, we, we don't like fake. We're, we, we're, if we're honest, we really don't like fake. I remember when, when uh, there was a season when I was young and poor that I bought the like, generic soda. Yeah, I did that for a couple of times and I had, like, you know, it, was like, it, it would change. Each time you buy it, it's like a different flavor. It's like, no. Nope, I want, the, I want the real stuff, although I'm a Pepsi guy, so I'm not going to get the real thing. But uh, <laughs> See, we don't like fake, and neither does Jesus. Neither does Jesus. He doesn't, doesn't like fake. In fact, if you read the Bible, if you read the Gospels, you will discover that Jesus, uh, his harshest words were reserved for religious leaders. People who are dedicated to living their life for God. People who, who taught other people about God. Who, who, whose lives tried to represent what it meant to follow God. And Jesus called them hypocrites. Literally the word hypocrite means actor. They were faking it. They were acting the part. They didn't have a real uh, experience, real relationship with the living God. They were fake. He accused them for, uh, of speaking for God and then doing the opposite. He told them that they were like whitewashed tombs. They were beautiful on the outside, and they were rotten and dead on the inside. They were fake. And he didn't like fake. And against that backdrop, a former Pharisee, a former hypocritical religious leader named the Apostle Paul, wrote these words in Romans chapter 12, Verses 9 through 21. He says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. 
If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I want you to notice the very first phrase, very first sentence in this text, which is the overarching challenge from the Apostle Paul, let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. Let love be sincere. Uh, If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're here and you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then we are to love sincerely. We are to love genuinely. We are to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're to love our neighbors as ourself. And we know this. I mean, I, I've grown up in church my whole life. I've been in, in church almost every weekend uh, since, since I was, uh, well, let's see, nine months before I was born. Okay? That, I mean, that's just, that, that's just the culture I was raised in. And, and everybody knew that we were supposed to love each other. But uh, honestly, the church has done this so poorly. So poorly. We, we fall into that Pharisee trap. We talk about loving people. Everybody knows, oh yeah, we love everybody. We talk about loving people all the time, but we don't do it well because we want to look good on the outside. So we practice our church smiles, right? And we carry our Bibles around. And maybe we even worship enthusiastically, whatever that means in whatever church you've been in. Maybe you should say appropriately. But, and, and we lie through our teeth when people ask, so how are you? And, and what's the stock answer? Fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Right? We're fine and, and on Sunday, and then on Monday we file for divorce. We're fine on Sunday, and then Monday we go bankrupt. Or we lost our job on Friday, but we still tell people we're fine on Sunday. Let love be genuine, real, honest, sincere. And and, and we can't love in in a genuine way. We can't love sincerely unless we are genuine, unless we're real, unless we are sincere. In other words, we can't be fake if we're going to love genuinely. And so the truth is, we're all a mess. If you read the Bible, you know this. If you're honest with yourself, you know this. We're all people who who struggle. We're we're sinners who who fail. We have bad days. We we stumble. We rebel. And we must love genuinely if we're going to represent Jesus. I mean, that's the reality. And Paul knows this. He knows who we are. He's already told us this. If you've read the book of Romans, if you've been with us, he knows we're sinners. And he still says, let love be genuine genuine. Now, if you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, you're probably not impressed by fake either, are you? No. See, none of us are impressed by fake. Uh, But we want you to know Jesus loves you genuinely, and he will change your life if you surrender to him. So the rest of today, we're going to discuss genuine love and what it actually looks like. So, by the way, if you're not yet a Jesus follower, uh, this is a life he calls us to. So we want you to know that. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, I'm going to ask six questions based on the text. Actually, just half the text, because this is a two-part sermon. So there you go. Uh, we're going to continue it next week, all right? But, but the first half of the text, I'm going to ask you six questions, and, and they're about practical faith, so that you can evaluate the sincerity of your love. Now, here, here's what uh, I hope you heard me say. I'm not going to tell you whether your love is sincere or not, because I can't do that. I can answer that for one person only, and that's me. This is a conversation for you, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. 
And you're here, so I'm going to encourage you to have it. But this is not a conversation that's going, to, that's going to take place in the next 20 minutes. It's a conversation that starts now, and you need to continue this throughout the week. So you and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God have a conversation about your life and about your love and whether or not it's sincere. So here we go. So for our love to be genuine, number one, what are you grasping? What are you grasping? Did you notice verse 9 let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, or hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Hate what's evil, cling to what is good. This is simply a question of what's in your hands. What's in your hands? Is it good? Is it holy? Is it godly? Is it evil, filthy, and rotten? What are you holding on to with your life? Uh, now, I know, we're, it's not really about what's in our hands because we hide it so much better than that, right? We, we don't let people see what's in our hands because we, it's really about what's in our heart. It's about what you're desiring, what you're wanting, what you're hoping to get. What are you setting your affections on, if you will? What, what is your mindset? What are, what are your goals that you're not publicizing? That maybe you're not wearing on your shirt or you're not, you know, blogging about. What's going on inside of you that other people can't see that's determining the direction of your life? So, what are you holding on to? What is God asking you to release? And what is it that God wants you to take hold of? Because, see, here's the dynamic that happens uh, in a lot of our lives, at least it does in my life, is I'm holding on to stuff and God says, let it go. Let it go. Let go of that habit. Let go of that sin. Let go of that attitude. Let go of that thought. Let it go. And, and why does God want us to let it go? Because it's destroying our lives. It's harming our marriages. It's hurting our families. It, it's making us a, a poor employee. What, whatever the, the, the context is, what, whatever God wants you to let go of is causing you harm. And he's saying, let go of that which is evil which is destructive in your life, which is selfish in your life, and take hold of that which is good. Take hold of those things that uh, are going to bless you. So what is God asking you to release, and what does God want you to take hold of? Because you can't love genuinely if you're holding on to evil things. So what are you grasping? Second question, are you energized to serve? Look at verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. You know, we don't really use the word slothful a whole lot in our vocabulary, right? When was the last time you caught, hey, you're being slothful. Now, we usually use the word lazy, right? But, you know, this translation says slothful in zeal. So I got to ask, how many of you saw the movie Zootopia? Okay, a lot of hands went up. So those of you who raised their hands, you know what I'm ref about to reference. The rest of you need to go home and on YouTube type in Sloth Zootopia. Okay, or if you type in Sloth Zootopia, will show up. Just click on that and watch it. It'll be three and a half minutes of hilarity. You will love it. Because in the movie, uh, uh, this person who's in a hurry runs into sloths and they're just not going to hurry at all. And it's, and it's thinking hilarious, but it's brought the word sloth and the idea of sloth into the younger generation. Because it's a kid's movie. So when it comes to serving Jesus, are you a sloth? When it comes to serving Jesus, are you lacking in zeal? In other words, are you being lazy? See, I didn't say the questions would be easy. I just said that you and the Holy Spirit and the Bible need to talk about this. Now, I love how Calvary serves. It thrills my heart to lead a church where so many people are serving. I went up to the McCulloch campus on Saturday afternoon to, to pray, because that's what I do uh, every Saturday afternoon. And, uh, and there was somebody there uh, installing a new door, one of our volunteers. Just as this, I, we need to get this done. And I was like, awesome. So, uh, you know, I love how Calvary serves. And, and I love how our community counts on Calvary to help them. I mean, they actually call us when they're needing help. Say, hey, can you guys do this for us? Can you guys serve? 
See, I, and I love how Calvary serves, offering excellent children's ministry and student ministry and life groups and worship and first impressions, all of that. But we could expand our impact with more volunteers and more energy. Let's just be honest about it. If all of us were serving with zeal, another word we don't use a whole lot, with energy, then uh, what, a, what kind of an impact we make on our community? Genuine love serves. We want our love to be genuine, then it involves serving. So the question is, are you energized to serve? Here's a, here's a little test that you can give to yourself to see how energized you are to serve. For the last couple of weeks, you've heard a lot about Serve Our Schools. October the 6th, we're going to be in every school in the city, and we're going to be cleaning, painting, landscaping, doing whatever they ask us to do. And we want to complete these projects in one day, really in one morning probably. Uh, but we need volunteers to make that happen. There's tables set up outside. So when you exit out the front doors to the right, you can go by, you can sign up. If you're in a life group, you should be saying to the life group, hey, how are we going to go serve? Because we can do a project as a group. It's really that simple. So here's the test, though. We talk about Serve Our Schools. Are you, like, excited for Serve Our Schools? Can I, can I just be honest? I'm excited about serve our, serve our Schools, and I have absolutely no discernible skills that apply to Serve Our Schools. But I'm going to show up, and I'm going to have a paintbrush, and I found out that I actually get to use it this year because my wife's going to be taking care of the grandkids. And so, uh, and, and I'm like, oh, oh, awesome. I'd be able, I can help. I never can help to her standards, but I can help. So, uh, so I, I'm going to be able to use my non-gifts to, to serve our schools. And some of you are really gifted in that area. And, and you sh are you excited about going and serving? Some of you are not gifted in that area. Are you excited about going and serving? You see, it, it, it's, it's our attitude. Or do you feel like, oh, i got to go serve? Do you feel obligated? You heard serve our schools and you groaned in your spirit because you're like, I should go, but I don't want to. Or maybe you heard Serve Our Schools and you just started coming up with a plan to avoid it. You see, it, it, it's, it's about our attitude and are we energized to serve because when we serve others in Jesus' name, it, God's power flows into our lives. And we don't get that, we don't expect that, so we avoid serving and we miss out on the power of God that energizes our lives. So are you energized to serve. It's how we know that we have genuine love. Third question. How's your prayer life? How is your prayer life? Verse 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Constant in prayer. How's your prayer life? See, if, if we're going to have genuine love, then our prayer life needs to be healthy. Now, we know that Jesus is always with us. The moment you confess Jesus as Lord, God the Holy Spirit entered your life. You're never alone. God is always there. So, do you talk with God throughout the day? Is that conversation, by the way, prayer is just conversation with God. Are you having conversation with God throughout the day? Or do you just pray when you need something from God? Do you just pray when you're afraid and you're going to the doctor or you're afraid when you're driving? Do you just pray when, when you're afraid for your kids or your grandkids? Do you just pray when you need something? Or is prayer something that you do as a natural thing? See, if you've got adult kids, do your kids just talk to you because they like to talk to you or do they only talk to you when they need something? See, if they talk to you all the time, then, and when they need something, you probably know it before they ask. But if they only call you up and ask for stuff, you probably are really annoyed. We're God's kids. If, if we're going to love genuinely, then we need to spend time with God because our love flows from God to us. Okay. Okay. Let me explain this. God is love. So when you're with God, the love of God flows into your life and enables you to love genuinely other people. Guess what happens? If you're not with God, your capacity to love dries up. It really is that simple. 
If you're with God, your capacity to love increases because you're with the person whose idea it was to love, whose character is love, whose command is love, who demonstrated his love in sacrificing himself on the cross for our sins. And so the closer you are with Jesus, the more genuine your love becomes. And if you're not with Jesus, then you're not going to have the capacity to love. So how's your prayer life? Now, I asked that because, you know, a couple weeks ago, we challenged you with the 50-day Bible reading kind of thing. And and, uh, you guys still reading your Bible every day because we gave you the the list and stuff like that? And hopefully that's been beneficial to you. Hopefully in your life groups you're talking about the verses or the chapters that God's really spoken to you about. But how easy is it for you to pray during that Bible reading? You know, pray as you're going into it to finish it and pray that God will help you to, to do those things. You know, today was Proverbs 12. It's my prayer is always that I would not have reckless words that pierce like a sword, but instead I'd have a tongue that is wise and brings healing. And, and so, you know, are, are we spending that time with God? Because that's going to affect our love and allow it to be genuine. Fourth question. Do you invite others into your life? Do you invite others into your life? Verse 13, he says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Seek to show hospitality. This is all about caring for others. So are you inviting others into your life? It it is a uh, slightly debated on the number, but between 70 and 80% of churches in America are declining. They're dying. They're dying. They use the word plateaued or declining. Plateaued just means that you're treading water and eventually you're going to run out of steam and drown. But, I mean, that's what happens if you just tread water forever. So, and much of it, I believe, is because of a lack of hospitality. The churches lack hospitality. And, and if you went to those churches and you asked them that, they would tell you, we are a friendly church. We love each other. We're so friendly. And the problem is that they're friendly to their friends. They're friendly to the people that they know. But if you're a guest and you walk in from outside, they're not friendly to you at all. I mean, you might even sit in one of their seats without knowing it. And then they're going to ask you to move, tell you that's their seat. They, you might sit there and watch them love each other and ignore you. Do you know that's not really a good feeling? Have you ever been the outsider watching a group have a lot of fun? That really is a painful place to be. And how tragic it is that the people who are charged by God with loving the world would ignore the world when the world comes and visits. That is a lack of hospitality. I don't care how many donuts you take to your prayer circle. See, we we need to be treating people with, with the love of Christ when they come into our churches, when they come into our fellowships, when they come into our gatherings, as well as when we go out, we need to show love to people. Um, by the way, just for the record, um, if you ask somebody to move because they're sitting in your seat, you failed the hospitality test. <laughs> and if you want to know the one thing that will set me off, faster than anything else is let me hear you do that because then uh, some righteous indignation will reveal itself uh, in that moment and I will repent later uh, the uh, uh, it's it just it's it's reality we, we need to be aware of this so that we can invite others into our lives so do you invite anyone into your life or do you just ignore people you don't know uh, you see, th- this gathering is a crowd, and, and so you can come in here and nobody can, you know, talk to you or know you and stuff like that, and you can just be anonymous, uh, which is why we want people to connect in life groups, because life groups is where the crowd becomes a family. And, and if you're lonely and if you're looking for connections, then join a life group. That's why we encourage life groups. That's why we need more leaders and hosts, people who have, you know, that, this hospitality thing down, who say, I want you to come and be a part of my life. I want you to come and connect to the body of Christ and we can care about you. 
but it goes way beyond the formal connections of greeters who smile and shake your hand and, and life groups. Do you see the people around you? Here's a little test. Take a look around you, like the immediate vicinity around you right now. I know it'll be awkward because you guys are going to look at each other and fail the test. Uh, but uh, now, how many of you in that area immediately around you saw somebody you don't know? Okay. Oh, look at that. Hands all over the place. So why is it we don't introduce ourselves and ask their names? Because well, I did that once, and, and I don't remember their name now. <laughs> Look, I reintroduce myself to people all the time. Ask a couple before the service. So how long have you been coming? Two years. <laughs> yeah, see, that's a fail. So if I'm failing in this, you can fail in this too, all right? The older we get, the worse our memories are anyway, so just go ahead and accept the fact that, that you're going to introduce yourself to somebody that you've already introduced yourself to like 12 times. I do it all the time. You can do it too. Join me and go ahead and being joyfully hospitable and, and just failing on the name game. We'll, we'll figure it out. And, and here's the deal. Just go ahead and here's the rules for Calvary. If you introduce yourself to somebody like for the third time or more, then you have to take them out to dinner afterwards. Okay? If you're like, I can't remember your name, so I owe you dinner. Let's go. Uh, you know, but, but why not invite, you know, why not introduce yourself to people? Why not invite them to, to join you for dinner afterwards? You don't have to pick up the check just because you invite them. Say, hey, we're going to dinner. Would you want to go with us? What, why not go ahead and, and make that effort to include people in your life? You go, well, I'm an introvert. Uh, okay, so be selective then. Just invite one or two people. You don't have to invite a crowd. Some of us like to travel in groups of 10 to 20, and others like to do 2 to 4. It's okay. It doesn't excuse us from being hospitable. And by the way, why not invite your neighbors or your coworkers to church? You can include dinner or lunch in there if you want to. But are you inviting others into your life? That's what genuine love looks like. Fifth question. Is your celebration and compassion appropriate? Verse 15 simply says something that should make sense anyway. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You go, well, of course we're going to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're going to weep with those who weep. That's just what you do. That's what you do if you love genuinely. You see, this is a great test of our hearts. This is a great test of our love. How do we respond to the victories and tragedies of others? How do we respond to the victories and tragedies of others? Because let's just go ahead and, and put it on the table. Envy is real and it lives in our hearts. Envy is something that's very real that every one of us in this room, uh, because we're breathing, has to deal with. So when a friend or a coworker or a relative succeeds... Do you rejoice or do you grieve? Do you rejoice or do you get jealous? I mean, do you really celebrate with them or do you go, I wish it was me. It's kind of not fair. I deserve it more than they do. Or when someone you know fails, do you grieve with them or are you smiling on the inside? You know that that friend or acquaintance whose marriage looked too perfect on Facebook and and, and all and they look happier than you and, and and everything and suddenly you find out that their marriage fell apart are you genuinely broken for them or do you do the happy dance inside or maybe that friend or relative who's better looking than you and more successful than you and, and healthier than you and do you kind of smile when they get fired or when they get sick, and you think, oh, it couldn't happen to a better person. You see, I know those are kind of unfair questions, but they're absolutely the questions that we need to answer because for us to love genuinely, we really need to rejoice with those who rejoice, and we need to grieve with those who grieve. It means that we're willing to lay aside what we want at that time, and we're going to enter into another person's life, and we're going to lift them up rather than pull them down. That's what real love looks like. So are you celebrating and grieving appropriately? And then number six. How do you respond 
to harsh people. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Now I know uh, some of you are going, wait a minute, you just did 14 after 15, why'd you do that? Because this is where we're going to pick up next week. This is where we're going to lean into next week, this to the end of the chapter. But I, I wanted you to, to, to wrestle with this because this is how love really shows itself. Because we all know that people can be mean. Right? Sometimes they're mean accidentally, but sometimes they're mean on purpose. We're talking about slander and rumors and, and, you know, trying to exclude you or sabotage you or your kids or your family. You see, all that's possible. So when somebody does that to you, what is your usual response? When somebody hurts you, uh, how do you respond? Because genuine love chooses to bless instead of curse. Let that sink in for a minute. This is Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is Jesus grieving with the rich young ruler when he walked away because he wouldn't give up everything to follow Jesus. It's blessing those who curse you. And this is one of the most difficult and revealing moments in our life spiritually. You're attacked. You're hurt. Your family is hurt. What do you do? Do you attack back? Or do you choose to bless them instead? See, a lot of us are going, well, if they just attack me, then I'll bless them and I can do that. But if they attack and hurt my family, the gloves are off and I'm going after their throat. And... and we feel that way naturally, so let's just go ahead and put it on the table. To do what God calls us to do, we have to fight against our natural inclinations. And, and it has nothing to do with being easy. This is not easy at all. This is about us choosing to love like Jesus because we want to love in a way that is sincere. And by the way, the power of love is unleashed in our lives when we respond like Jesus. And the reason that so many times we lack the power of God in our lives, even in the midst of praising God and telling him he has a name above every name, and we think about the power of God's name, and, and we're the children of God, so we should have that power. And the reason that we don't is because we don't choose to love sincerely. We live on a level of faking it, and so we lack the absolute impact of the real deal. So let love be genuine. I don't know how you did on those six questions, but if you're like me, you got a ways to go. And the real question is, are you pursuing genuine love or just faking it? Are you going to pursue genuine love or are you willing to just mail it in? See, God knows the answer. And God is inviting me and you into a new way of life, a new way of love, greater and more powerful and more thrilling than anything we've ever experienced if we will surrender to him and ask the Holy Spirit to teach us how to love genuinely. Will you pray with me?